All right, folks, well, welcome back to the class. We are going to conclude now with uh, our study of Daniel chapter 11, primarily the last uh, several verses of the chapter. And we are going to continue our study at the subtitle, The Beginning Point of Daniel 11, 40 to 45. So I hope you're there in your syllabus. Uh, for those who uh, are watching this on uh, television or uh, getting the DVDs, I would suggest that you get the syllabus because the syllabus has so much more information than what we are able to cover here in the class. It's over 350 pages long and uh, it has a lot of good resource uh, information. Uh, so let's begin here. We have focused in this article or in this presentation mainly on the events of Daniel 11.44 to Daniel 12 and verse 2. But if we continued moving backwards in the book Great Controversy, that is before page 603, the final warning, we would find in reverse order that Ellen White expounds upon each phrase of Daniel 1140 to 45, ending with the chapter on the Bible and the French Revolution, where the deadly wound of Daniel 11 verse 40a is described. Though she does not employ the terminology of verses 40 to 45, the sequence of events clearly reveals that she is discussing these verses. In other words, if you keep on going backwards, uh, verse 43, 42, 41, 40, when you get to uh, the first phrase of verse 40, you're at the chapter, the Bible and the French Revolution, when the deadly wound is given. Uh, Ellen White uh, uh, rather, let, let's go to, uh, to the next paragraph. In Daniel 11, 40, uh, first part of the verse, we are told that the king of the south will push at the king of the north at the time of the end. Ellen White clearly identifies the beginning of the time of the end as what year? As 1798, when France dealt the papacy its deadly wound, when the pope was taken prisoner. Now, unfortunately, the word, uh, the translation push uh, is not really the best translation in the King James tradition because really the word is more than a friendly little shove. It really means to attack. And, um, you know, for example, the word is used in Daniel chapter 8 where it says that uh, the ram was pushing. It means that the ram was what? was attacking, that's right, was attacking uh, uh, to the different points of the compass. And uh, the NIV, of course, translates, will engage him in battle. In other words, the king of the south, at the time of the end, somehow would come against the king of the north. In fact, the English Standard Version translates, shall attack him. Now, here's the big question. Was there a power around the year 1798, culminating in 1798, that attacked the papacy? The answer is absolutely yes. Let's go to the next paragraph. There is a wide consensus among students of prophecy in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that the King of the North represents the papacy. And until recently, there was a broad consensus as well that the king of the south represents secularism. And some say communism, socialism, you know, it, it deals with, with the secular mindset, uh, which was manifested where? In the French Revolution. But times have changed, and some Adventist preachers, as they look at current events, are interpreting or reinterpreting the king of the south as a symbol of what? As a symbol of militant Islam, because Islam is in the news. Now, let's take a look at who the King of the South is. Literally and geographically, the King of the South was Egypt, because Egypt is south of Israel. Clearly, uh, this is not talking about literal geographical Egypt, because in the end time, we're not dealing with this literal nation. We are dealing with global systems. Right? Now, who is the king of the north, symbolically speaking? 
I believe that Revelation chapter 11, which is linked with the fifth and sixth trumpets, clearly identifies France as spiritual Egypt, while Babylon represents a global apostate religious system. So uh, Babylon represents a apostate religious system, whereas the King of the South represents secularism. Egypt represents secularism. Egypt symbolizes the secular powers of the world that threw off the yoke of papal Rome beginning with France. Revelation 17 explains that for a very short while at the end of time the secular powers of the world will once again join together in unholy wedlock with the harlot but in the end the kings of the earth will hate the Bar Babylonian harlot and destroy her. Are you seeing the, uh, the connection between what happened in the French Revolution and what is going to happen at the end of time? Was there an uprising against the papacy in France in 1798? Actually 1789 to 1798. Absolutely. Is there going to be an uprising of the kings against the papacy at the end of time? The, the secular minded of the world. Absolutely. Now Babylon was literally and geographically the king of the north in biblical times because it was the enemy that invaded literal Israel from the literal north. But today the king of the north is a global spiritual system of counterfeit religion, the Roman Catholic papacy. The papacy is certainly not literally north of literal Israel. Is that true? <laughs> it's, it's actually what? It's actually west. We must therefore interpret the king of the north and the king of the south symbolically. In other words, we're dealing with symbols here. Egypt is not literal Egypt. It, Egypt is fulfilled in a system that has the characteristics that Egypt had. And the king of the north is fulfilled in a global system that has the characteristics of literal Babylon in the Old Testament. Now what was the main characteristic of France, the king of the south, or Egypt, spiritually speaking, in 1798? The spirit of the French Revolution was what? Atheism or secularism. In other words, no religion. But actually Daniel 11.40a involves far more than atheism when it says that the king of the south will attack the king of the north at the time of the end. The genius of the revolution, culminating with the captivity of Pope Pius VI, was to secularize the government and separate it from its adulterous relationship with the church. Are you following me? In the course of several decades after the French Revolution, country after country in Europe established secular governments separate from the dominance of the papacy. In fact, there's this quotation from Henry Cardinal Manning that I read uh, before in a previous presentation. In 1862, he was complaining about how all of Europe had forsaken the papacy because they had formed secular governments as a result of the French Revolution that separated church and state. Notice what he had to say. This is in his book, The Temporal Power of the Vicar of Jesus Christ. See this Catholic church. This church of God, feeble and weak, rejected even by the very nations called Catholic. There is Catholic France and Catholic Germany and Catholic Italy giving up this exploded figment of temporal power. In other words, giving up the idea that the church should have temporal power of the vicar of Jesus Christ. And so because the church seems weak, and the vicar of the Son of God is renewing the passion of his master upon the earth. Therefore we are scandalized. Therefore we turn our faces from him. So what began in France extended basically to the whole world through governments that are secular. In other words, that separate religion from the power of the state. But Ellen White has said, that the papacy will rise to power once again. She says, let the restraints now imposed by secular governments, by what? Oh, so what did France do? Was France a secular government? Did it impose a restriction upon the papacy? Yes. 
Let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be what? Removed. And Rome be reinstated in her former power, and there would speedily be a revival of her tyranny and persecution. So, let's take a look at the beginning and ending point of verses 40 through 45. Daniel 11, 40, the first part of the verse, is commented on in great controversy 265 to 288. Here, in this chapter called the Bible and the French Revolution, France attacks the papacy and inflicts the deadly wound. That is what is meant by the king of the south will what? Will push or will attack the king of the north. The illicit love relationship between church and state is severed and thus the papacy is restrained. So that's the beginning of verse 40. So, so where, does, where does the passage of verse 40 to 45 begin? It begins with the deadly wound at the French Revolution when the king of the south, which is France, remember what was the characteristics of France? France said, who is the Lord? I don't know the Lord, and I won't let his people go. That's what Pharaoh said. And by the way, Revelation 11 calls France in the French Revolution Egypt. So we know that we're dealing with spiritual Egypt here. Then we continue. Daniel 11:40, the last half of the verse, through verse 43, Ellen White comments on in Great Controversy 289 to, to 605. And this is your homework. Your homework is to go and find Ellen White's comments on all of the details that we find in those verses. Uh, from verse... Uh, 40b through verse 43. Uh, if you want to cheat, you can read my Daniel syllabus. <laughs> but it's better not to cheat. It's better to study it for yourself. And then in uh, Daniel 11:44a through, uh, actually Daniel Daniel 44 11:44a is commented on in Great Controversy, page 605. We already dealt with this specific issue. It deals with the loud cry, the sealing message, and the, the trouble that would enrage the papacy against God's people because of the loud cry and the sealing message. Then, in Daniel 11:44b, the last half of the verse, through uh, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1a, is commented on in Great Controversy, page 607 with a flashback to the past in Great Controversy 6.14 and 6.15. This is the rage of the wicked. Remember the king of the north will go out with great wrath to annihilate and destroy many? It's because of the tidings from the north and the east. So Ellen White is following the same order. So Daniel 11, 44b and 12.1a, which is when Michael stands up, uh, is describing... Um, the loud cry message and the sealing message, and then Michael stands up and closes the door of probation and begins defending his people from the rage of the wicked. Then in Daniel 11.45a, the first half of the verse, you have what I believe to be the universal death decree against God's people. That's the strategic location of the king of the north to strike and to destroy God's people and obliterate them from the face of the earth. And that is commented on in Daniel 12, verse 1, where it speaks about the time of trouble that God's people will go through. And Ellen White, in Great Controversy, page 613 and following, is commenting on the universal death decree, and she's commenting about the uh, final death blow that the wicked will want to deliver upon God's people. And then in Daniel 11, 45b, and Daniel chapter 12 and verse and uh, the third part of verse uh, 3, and Great Controversy 635 and following, Ellen White describes the, um, she describes the uh, liberation of God's people or the deliverance of God's people. Are you following along? And then uh, Daniel 12 verse 2, which is the very next verse, Great Controversy 637, she comments on the special resurrection. So are you seeing the sequence in, in the writings of Ellen White? 
Does she have anything to say about Daniel 11, 40 to 45? She most certainly does. She has a lot to say about these verses. So summarizing, Daniel 11, 40a is commented in Great Controversies 265 to 288. Daniel 11, 40b through verse 43 is commented on in Great Controversy 289 to 605. Daniel 11, 44a is commented on in Great Controversy 605. Daniel 11, 44b and Daniel 12, 1a is commented on in Great Controversy 607. Daniel 11, 45a and Daniel 12, 1b is commented on in Great Controversy 613 and following. Daniel 11, 45b and Daniel 12, uh, verse 1c is commented on in Great Controversy, page 635 and following. And then the special resurrection in Daniel 12, verse 2 is commented on in Great Controversy, page 637. Does she discuss things in the exact order of Daniel 11 and 12, 1 and 2? The exact precise order in the Great Controversy. So at the bottom of the page, Thus the two reference points for the beginning and ending of Daniel 11, 40 to 45 are the French Revolution at the beginning as described in Great Controversy 265 through 288 and the deliverance of God's people in the special resurrection in Great Controversy 635 and 637. In between these two reference points we have the events that Ellen White describes in Great Controversy 289 through 604. A careful study of these pages will reveal that Ellen White comments on all the details in verses 40b through 43 without actually using the language. Now why doesn't she use the language? Well let's talk about Ellen G. White and Islam. It is simply amazing to me how Ellen White vividly describes the events of Daniel 11, 40 through 45 without ever quoting the verses or even alluding to the language. Why didn't she just come out and quote the verses and then comment on them? There is a clear historical reason, as I was mentioning before. The original view of the pioneers was that the King of the North represents the Roman Catholic Papacy. This is clearly expressed in the little publication, little pamphlet, A Word to the Little Flock Scattered Abroad, which was co-authored by James and Ellen White in 1847. But in the early 1870s, Uriah Smith, who was the highly respected editor of the Review and Herald, changed or shifted the view that the King of the North was actually Turkey. And the reason why is because Turkey was prominent in the news at that time. James White was flabbergasted by Smith's new view and accused him of removing one of the landmarks of the Advent movement. Things started getting nasty and members began taking sides. In this context, Ellen White instructed her husband to desist of his criticism. She knew that an understanding of Daniel 11, 40 to 45 was not a matter of life or death at that time. Her main concern at the moment was to preserve the unity of the church. If Ellen White had quoted the verses in Daniel 11, 40 to 45 and offered a view contradictory to Uriah Smith's, she would have been accused of nepotism. So she commented on these verses without quoting them or alluding to the language knowing full well that someday someone would discover her view of the matter. Significantly, in the eschatological, that's the end time portion of Great Controversy, Ellen White does not mention Islam even once as playing any role in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in the end time. It appears that Ellen White saw no prophetic significance to the rise of radical Islam. The same is true of the great chain prophecies of Scripture. There is no reference to Islam in the prophecies of Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8 and 9, Revelation 12, Revelation 13, Matthew 24, or Revelation 17. There is no reference either to Islam in the churches and in the sequence of the seals. 
So why would we inject Islam into this prophecy, which is clearly parable, parallel to Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 8 and 9? Now, Ellen White's silence on the role of Islam in Bible prophecy has puzzled some Seventh-day Adventist scholars, such as Tim, Tim Rosenberg, who have concluded that Ellen White simply did not have all the light on end-time events. At least one of these scholars has even reached the conclusion that Ellen White was wrong in her interpretation of the little horn as a symbol of the papacy and has reinterpreted the little horn as Islam. And that was Sam Bakioki. I can mention his name because he passed away. Uh, but he, uh, he really went off the deep end toward the end of his life, uh, unfortunately questioning many things in the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy. Now, um, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that Islam might not play a role in the precipitation of end time events as described in the book The Great Controversy. It is true that Islam might serve as a catalyst for the fulfillment of Bible prophecies concerning the United States and the papacy, but I do not believe that the rising power of militant Islam is contemplated directly by prophecy itself. That is to say, in the light of the biblical evidence, I do not believe that radical Islam fulfills any specific end time prophecy, but very well could serve as a catalyst for the fulfillment of prophecy. After all, radical Islam has brought the United States to prominence and has led it to flex its military muscles. It has made the curtailing of our civil and religious liberties easier, including torture, by the way, and it has also misdirected the eyes of Christians and even of a few Seventh-day Adventists to the Middle East for the fulfillment of prophecy, thus hiding from view the powers that will play a role in end-time events, the papacy and apostate Protestantism. Time has proven that Uriah Smith's reinterpretation of the King of the North was wrong. Will we learn from his mistake? Will we ever learn that the best way to understand prophecy is not to read the newspapers or to watch CNN, but rather to study our Bibles. <laughs> so um, that is our study on the King of the North. Was it clear? You know, Je Jeannie was telling me that she read this article, because this is an article that appeared in our, a newsletter a while back, and she says she read it three times, and she did her utmost to fully understand it, but she couldn't. She says, but now I understand it, now that you've presented it in the class. So I hope that's uh, the case with uh, many others as well, uh, you know, because this is a complex, complex subject because you're working backwards and forwards. You're looking at different page numbers. You're looking at different phrases. You know, you're, you're really taking all the pieces together, putting them together like a detective does all of the evidence, you know, takes all of the evidence and places it all together. And then you have the complete puzzle. You said, wow, look at the puzzle. It's complete. I get the full picture. And so that's the way many times that we have to study these things. Now, the rest of our time, we are going to go to Revelation chapter 17. Isn't that an exciting item of news, going to Revelation 17? That is a phenomenal chapter. And the key that unlocks Revelation 17 is Revelation 12 and Revelation 13. You have to understand Revelation 12 and 13 to understand 17. And we've already studied Revelation 12 and Revelation chapter 13, as well as Daniel 7, so we have a head start. Now this is not going to be as difficult as if we started just with Revelation chapter 17. So let's go uh, in our syllabus to page 281, page 281, uh, and we are going to take a look at decoding the mysteries of Revelation 17. This is chapter 15 in your syllabus. Now, uh, let's begin at the very top. The book of Revelation is saturated with exa exotic imagery. This imagery, which is known theologically as apocalyptic, was part of the lingua franca, that means of the figures of speech, the way of speaking, in that day when John wrote. And so in order to understand this, this many times bizarre imagery, we must walk in the shoes of the people of that time. 
That is, we must understand the symbolism as they understood the symbolism and not as people understand the symbolism in the 20th century. You know, I was reading a commentary about uh, the locusts in um, Joel chapter 3. And, uh, you know, uh, it said in that uh, book that I was reading that those locusts represent helicopters. <laughs> Well, that's no way of studying the scriptures. Other people say, you know, uh, red uh, is the color of communism. So this beast that rises in Revelation 17 is a scarlet beast. So it must represent communism. Other individuals say, well, you need to reapply the beast of Daniel 7. The lion would be England and the bear would be Russia. And so they start reinterpreting and reestablishing all of these symbols and giving them meaning, meanings that were not intended in the original text. So we have to understand all this symbolism in the light of the way that it was understood in biblical times. Revelation 17 is one of the most complex and intellectually challenging chapters in the book of Revelation. It contains vivid symbols, mysterious numbers, strange expressions. It is like a giant jigsaw puzzle with each symbol being a piece of the puzzle. Before we can um, put the puzzle together, we must carefully analyze the shape of each piece to see where it fits within the puzzle as a whole. Have you ever put a jigsaw puzzle together? What's the first thing that you do when you put a jigsaw puzzle together? You classify it by colors, don't you? By looking at the picture on the box. And so you classify it by colors. And once you have everything classified, then you begin to put the jigsaw puzzle together. And so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to interpret each symbol individually and then we're going to take all of the symbols and we're going to assemble the complete picture. That's the way that we're going to work. Fortunately, Revelation 17 has two parts. The first part is the vision that was given to John. And the second part is the interpretation that the angel gave to the vision. So the wonderful thing about Revelation 17 is we not only have the vision, but we also have the interpretation of the vision by the same angel that originally gave the vision. By the way, the vision is found in verses 1 through 8, and the interpretation of the vision is found in verses 9 through 18. Now the next portion is a very important point, and that is, that Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1 tells us that the book of Revelation was signified. You can find that very clearly in that verse. God signified the book. What word do we have in the word signified? The word sign. In other words, the book of Revelation is written in sign language. It is symbolic language. And what we have to do is we have to decode or we have to decipher the meaning of the symbols. Are you following me? We, need, we can't take the symbols at face value. We have to see what the symbols represent beyond themselves. So they have to be unsealed, in other words. Now in order to understand the symbolic language of Revelation 17, we must have wisdom. Revelation 17, 9 says, Here is wisdom. So we need to have wisdom in order to understand this chapter. And whom does wisdom come from? Wisdom comes from God, according to James chapter 1 and verse 5. It is not enough to study Revelation 17. We must pray that God gives us supernatural wisdom from on high to understand it. And I'll tell you what my personal experience has been. Sometimes I struggle with very difficult portions of Scripture. And sometimes I reach a point where I say I can go no further. I just don't get this. I don't know how to solve this problem. And guess what I do? I suspend my study at that moment. And I say, Lord, I'm at a dead end. I know that there's meaning to this, but I just cannot understand what the meaning is. I don't know where in the Bible to search for the explanation and for the connections. 
please help me find the explanation. Amen. And I can't say that always I open my eyes and suddenly I have the explanation. Sometimes I have to pray many times. And it takes sometimes days, sometimes it takes weeks, and sometimes it takes months. But I found that in most cases, God has given me wisdom to be able to determine the meaning of the passage that I'm struggling with. So we should never forget the importance of prayer as we study uh, not only prophecy, but as we study the Bible in general. Now let's go to our next section. The Angel of Revelation 17. This is a vitally important detail in this vision. Revelation 16 describes seven angels who pour out the seven last plagues upon the earth. This vision of Revelation 17 was given to John by one of the seven angels. That's what it says in Revelation 17, verse, that, verse 1. It says, one of the seven angels came back to speak to John. Of course, for those who have an inquisitive mind, the question is, which of the seven came back to speak with John? See, th this is a secret to study the Bible. Don't read. Ask questions. Why? Where? Who? Why does it say this way? Why does it use this word? Are there any other texts that connect with this one? You know, we need to, when we approach the text, we need to ask the text questions and then seek to answer the questions. So as I read verse 1, uh, you know, I said, now wait a minute, one of the seven angels comes back to talk to John, one of the seven plague angels. I want to know which one. Can we know which one? And so I continued studying, and I discovered that we can know which one comes back to talk to John. It doesn't say so in verse 1, but if we do the work of a detective, we can discover which is the one that comes back. Let's continue to the next paragraph. The answer to this question is not hard to find. The harlot of Revelation 17 is described as a woman sitting on what? On many waters. And on her forehead is found the inscription, what? Mystery, Babylon the Great. So the harlot is sitting on many waters, and her name is what? Her name is Babylon. She is also called the great city, which reigns over the kings of the earth. In antiquity, what was the great city? The great city was Babylon. Isn't, doesn't Nebuchadnezzar say, isn't this great Babylon that I have built? So the great city is what? Is Babylon. So you have this harlot, which represents the papacy, and it's sitting on many waters, and the name is Babylon. Now here's the question. What was the name of the river that ran through the city of Babylon? <laughs> the Euphrates River. So which river is the harlot sitting on? The harlot is sitting on the Euphrates River. Are you following me? Is this the literal Euphrates River? No, because Revelation 17 explains that the waters or the river upon which this Babylonian harlot sits represents what? Multitudes, nations, tongues, and people. So you have this harlot woman, her name is Babylon, she's sitting on many waters, and we know that the waters of Babylon was the river Euphrates. And so now you say, now wait a minute, river Euphrates, is there one of the seven plague angels who mentioned the Euphrates? Are you following me or not? Let's go to the next, let's go to the next paragraph. What was the name of the river that ran through the ancient city of Babylon? The answer to this question is provided by a geographical study of the region as well as by Scripture. The ancient city of Babylon sat upon the many waters of the river Euphrates. You can find that in Jeremiah 51 verses 12 and 13. This means that we must look for the bowl angel who refers to the river Euphrates 
And that bold angel is number what? Number six. So this angel is coming to explain the sixth plague. That's what I want you to remember. One of the seven angels comes to John. Right? And now he's going to explain plague number six. So this is the sixth angel that is coming back to talk to John. This means that we must look for the bull angel who refers to the river Euphrates, and that bull angel is the sixth in Revelation 16, verse 12. In other words, the angel who poured out the sixth plague upon the river Euphrates in Revelation 16, 12 through 16, came back to John in chapter 17 and further explained and expanded the meaning of that same plague in Revelation 17. In other words, Revelation 17 is an explanation and expansion of the sixth plague. Are uh, you understanding my point? This will become clearer as we go along. Now, let's go to the section, the harlot woman. We're, going to, we're looking at the pieces of the puzzle now. The harlot woman is the main protagonist of the story in Revelation 17. She sits on the waters. She sits on the dragon. She sits on the beast. She sits on the heads. She fornicates with the kings of the earth. She gives wines to the nations. She sheds the blood of the saints. She has dominion over the nations. And she is finally hated by the kings of the earth. So who is the central protagonist of this story? The central protagonist is the harlot. She is the one who is moving all the strings. Similar to the story of Elijah. Who moved all the strings in the story of Elijah? Jezebel. Who moved all the strings in the story of the martyrdom of John the Baptist? Herodias. Are you following me or not? In other words, there's a central figure that is orchestrating everything in chapter 17. Now, in the Old Testament, a harlot woman was a symbol of apostate Israel. So this harlot woman must represent the apostate church, right? Because Israel claimed to be God's people. In fact, Ellen White explains that the woman in Revelation 17 represents the papacy, the apostate religious system. In Great Controversy, page 381, she stated in Revelation 17, Babylon is represented as a woman, a figure which is used in the Bible as the symbol of a church, a virtuous woman representing a pure church, a vile woman an apostate church. So the harlot woman represents what? It represents a harlot church. And what is that harlot church today? It is the Roman Catholic papacy. Is this the same as the man of sin? Yes. Is it the same as the little horn? Yes. Is it the same as the beast? Yes. Is it the same as the king of the north? Is it the same as the clay? Is it the same as the abomination of desolation? All of these are pictures of the same end time system that will oppress and persecute God's people. So the harlot woman of Revelation 17 in the end time represents the papacy which has climbed on the back of what? Of the multitudes of the world and of the civil powers to persecute those who are not in agreement with her. But now I want you to understand something very important, and this is the last paragraph that we find on this page. In the end time, the harlot represents the Roman Catholic system. But this beast, this seven-headed beast, actually represents seven stages of apostate religion that has used the state to oppress God's people. Simply in the end time, the stage is the Roman Catholic papacy. But there were previous stages. Let me ask you, did Babylon persecute and oppress God's people? Did Medo-Persia oppress and, oppress and persecute God's people? You remember the days of Esther? Yeah. Daniel in the lion's den? Greece did also by putting the, the, the Jews in the Colosseum 
uh, you know, to, to fight naked with, with beasts. It wasn't only Rome. In fact, they loved, uh, the Greeks loved in their races to force the Jews to run naked because the Jews were circumcised and the Greeks did not get circumcised. And so the people had a jolly good time, the people in the stands, seeing the Jews running uh, naked in these uh, spectacles. So there was persecution by Greece. Was there persecution by Rome? There definitely was persecution by Rome. Was there persecution by Papal Rome during the 1260 years? Yes. Will there be persecution by the United States? Yes. So even though the harlot represents apostate religion at the end of time, specifically the papacy, apostate religion has climbed on this beast before, time and again, by using the civil power to persecute God's people. Now let's talk about her fornication. Is the harlot clear, the meaning of the harlot? <coughs> let's go to her fornication. If the harlot represents apostate religion, then her fornication with the kings of the earth must mean that she joins what? Church and state. We've studied this extensively. As much is confirmed by Ellen White. Ellen White has a lot to say about Revelation 17, believe it or not. In Great Controversy 382, she states, It was by departure from the Lord, an alliance with the heathen, that the Jewish church became a harlot. And Rome, notice she's applying it to the papacy, and Rome corrupting herself in like manner by seeking what? The support of worldly powers receives a like condemnation. So what does the fornication of the harlot represent? How, she did, how did she fornicate? How she, did she become a harlot? She became a harlot because she linked up with what? With the civil powers of the world, with the state. In Great Controversy, page 443, Ellen White comments, Whenever the church has obtained secular power, she has employed it to punish dissent from her doctrines. Protestant churches that have followed in the steps of Rome by forming alliance with what? There it is. Protestants are going to do the same thing. With worldly powers have manifested a similar desire to restrict, restrict liberty of conscience. So are you seeing the picture here? This apostate church links up with the kings of the earth with what purpose? To use the power of the kings or the secular power to enforce her decrees, her doctrines, and her practices. We've already studied this previously in Revelation 12 and 13. Now let's talk about the act of sitting. The Babylonian harlot is said to sit on many waters. She is said to sit on a scarlet beast. She is sitting on seven mountains and she is sitting on seven heads. You say, now wait a minute, how can she be sitting upon all four? Oh, we need to understand the ancient concept of river dragons. That's coming later on in this chapter. See, we have to understand how they understood Revelation 17, the symbolism in Revelation chapter 17, or else we won't be able to understand. Now, where was she sitting? Was she sitting on the heads? Was she sitting on the waters? Was she sitting on a beast? Was she sitting on seven mountains? What was she sitting on? Well, she was sitting on all of them. We're going to notice in our study. The act of sit sitting, what does that mean? The act of sitting means that the harlot not only what? Rules over the kings of the earth. You can read that in Revelation 17 verse 18. But she also rules over a what? Over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So in Revelation 17, you need to understand that this harlot, does this harlot control the ten horns, the kings? Yes. Does this harlot control the multitudes that she sits on? Absolutely. How does she control the multitudes? By using what? The kings. So I'm hoping that you're catching this picture of all these symbols as we put them together. Now let's talk about the waters that she sits upon. The waters upon which the harlot sits are clearly identified as multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. Later on in this study, we will find that the body of the dragon beast upon which the harlot sits is actually composed of the waters over which she rules. So in other words, the, the waters are really the body of a dragon. 
Now, just hold that in your mind. We'll come back to that. This is exotic imagery, which is really extremely important. Now, notice, uh, according to the prophet Isaiah, the nations make a noise like the noise of the seas and a rushing like the rushing of many waters. So what do the waters represent upon which the harlot sits? They are multitudes, nations, tongues, and people. So Revelation 17 says that she controls the kings. They're all of one mind. They do what the harlot says. They're going to hate her eventually. Are the multitudes also going to dry up on her? Are the waters going to dry up on her? Yeah, the kings will turn against her, and the waters will also turn against her. So far, so good? Now let's talk about the drying up. This is crucially important. That's why we studied Revelation 12 before we got here. A careful comparison of Revelation 12, 13, and 17 reveals that the persecuting waters upon which the woman sits in Revelation 17 were dried up once in the past. Did we study that before? When the fifth head and we'll, we'll come to that later. You'll see that it's the fifth head. When the fifth head was wounded in 1798. And they will be dried up once again in the future. When the seventh head is wounded at the time of the sixth plague. Let's take a look at these two occasions. And this is just review of Revelation 12. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 15. We are informed that the dragon... And how many heads does the dragon have? Seven heads. So it has how many mouths? Seven mouths. It said in, in Revelation 12, 15, we're informed that the dragon spewed water out of his mouth. Singular or plural? Singular. How long did he spew water out of his mouth? 1260 what? Years. With what purpose? Spewed waters, what do the waters represent? Multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. This, this dragon beast is spewing waters out of his mouth. And what is the purpose of spewing out the multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples? Because he wants to drown whom? He wants to drown the woman. He's persecuting the woman by using his waters, so to speak, the multitudes. Now, are the waters dried up at some point? Yes. Remember that the earth helped the woman and swallowed up the waters that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth? So does this head cease spewing out waters? Absolutely. The earth swallows up the waters. And is there a time of respite or, or a cessation of persecution, if you wish? Yes. Because the waters are no longer what? They're no longer flowing. Is that going to change? Yeah. What does Revelation 12, 17 say? Revelation 12, 17 says, Then the dragon, who spewed out the waters, will be enraged at the woman. Is he going to come after her again? Are the waters going to flow again? Yes, he will go after the woman and... He will do so because they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What was the name of that river that the, that the dragon spewed out of his mouth? We've studied this before. What was the name of that river? The Euphrates. You can read the note here. We already dealt with this specific point. Uh, the definite article, the river, is used in Revelation chapter 12. The dragon spews water like the river. And what is the river in the Bible when it doesn't have a name attached to it? It is the river Euphrates. So did the Euphrates flow during the 1260 years from one of the heads of this beast? It flowed. And what was the purpose of the flowing of the water? To drown God's faithful saints. Does Daniel 7 address this? The little horn would persecute what? The saints of the Most High. Now, Revelation 13 has the same scenario. Revelation 13, verses 1 through 10. Did the beast rule for 42 months? Is that the same time as the uh, 1260 days of chapter 12? 
Yes, it ruled for 42 months. What did it do during those 42 months? It persecuted the saints of the Most High. Now you don't have the symbolism of water here, but you have the same sequence of ideas. It persecuted the saints of the Most High. But what happened at the end of its period of dominion? One of its heads received a deadly wound. Is there a period of respite as a result? A period of peace. Are you, are you seeing the parallel? And that's the end of the story, right? The period of respite. One of the heads is wounded, just like the, like the head of Revelation 12 doesn't spew waters out anymore because they've been dried up. That's the end of the story, right? No. In Revelation 12, does the dragon spew waters out again to drown the woman? Yes. In Revelation 13, is the, this dragon going to spew waters out to persecute God's people again? You remember we studied about the beast that rises from the earth that's going to restore power to the power that, that spewed out the waters and persecuted? So is Revelation 13 parallel to Revelation chapter 12? Yes. During the 1260 years, the waters are being spewed out through the help of the United States and democratic governments. The waters are dried up and then the waters flow again. When this beast rises to power again, the dragon will once again persecute the woman. Now, is there going to be a final drying up of the waters that once again will be spewed out of the mouth of the dragon? Yes. See, you have to connect all of these verses. We have to have an inquisitive mind when we study Scripture. We need, where did I find this word before? Where did I find this phrase before? How is this related to this over here? We can't just read one passage, you know. The, uh, devotional study is a beautiful thing. But we have to do more than devotional study. We have to do deep, profound study. We have, for that, we have to dedicate time and effort. It's not, you know, we live in a, in a society of, of, of instant gratification. Isn't that true? We want things quick. We want everything easy. But, and, and people don't want to struggle anymore to, to, to work through the deep things of God. That's why we have so many gospel light sermons. You know, you can go to many Adventist churches. It's like going to the Baptist church. You actually you probably get a better sermon at some Baptist churches than some Adventist churches. It's gospel light. We're not living in a time when we should have gospel light. We should be searching the deep things of God so that people know what is happening and what is soon to explode upon the world scene as an overwhelming surprise. Don't we want to see people saved? Amen. Folks, if we want to see people saved, let's talk to them about these things. Oh, well, pastor, but they might be offended. Yes, that's true. They might be offended. So were the Jews that stoned Stephen when he preached his sermon. Who was the angriest when Stephen was stoned? Saul of Tarsus. Maybe Stephen should have toned it down a little bit. <laughs> his sermon offended the people that were there. It was a strong sermon, so maybe he should have toned it down a little bit. Let me ask you, was Stephen's sermon worth it? Are you telling me? Saul of Tarsus, at that moment, really, he knew that Stephen was right. And he kicked against the pricks. It means that he went persecuting so he wouldn't have to think about it. But the Lord said, buddy, I'm going to make you think. <laughs> and he knocked him to the ground. And that's where the conversation came through. Was Stephen's sermon worth it? Yeah. Yes, the great apostle Paul was converted as a result of Stephen's sermon. Oh, but he was offended. You know, I found when I present these things, sometimes people are deeply offended. They actually get angry at me. As if I were, I'm just the, 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 the person who presents the message from the scriptures. And they get mad. They say, wow, Pastor Bohr is talking against my church. He's talking against me. But I found that in the course of time when it sinks in, people say, wow, that's the truth. I have a particular, particular church member who, um, you know, when I presented this topic many years ago, right after I arrived in, in Fresno, I had an evangelistic series uh, uh, on the book of Genesis. And when I presented the topic on the, on the papacy, uh, she had, you know, been in a convent and she's very Catholic. Uh, man, she quit coming. 
And, uh, you know, she, she would come to church before, and now she would come only now and then. And when she saw me coming, she would uh, go in a different direction. But if there was not the possibility, you know, she would either not look at me or the look wasn't really friendly. And, uh, and so some people said, Pastor, you know, you shouldn't have preached that sermon. Because, see, she's not coming anymore. Well, to make a long story short, uh, you know, the truth sunk in. I could tell you other stories just like this. And, and she now is one of the most active members that we have at Fresno Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. I mean active. And she has so many positions in the church. She has so much for the church. Has three beautiful daughters. Her husband is a physician. It's amazing. And just a few years ago, she sent me a card. And she asked my forgiveness for all of the dirty looks. <laughs> I still have that card in my filing cabinet. So was it worthwhile preaching that sermon? It was. Just because people might be offended doesn't mean that we should not preach it. We should be nice. Don't be mean. Don't say, oh, you belong to the beast power. You're going to be going to hell. That's not the way we're going to present it. We're going to present it clear, strong, but we're going to say that there are many sincere and loving people in this system. By the way, the day... When Stephen and Saul of Tarsus meet, I have to see that. I've got to see that. Because Stephen doesn't know that Saul was converted. So imagine when they see one another. And Saul of Tarsus, you know, Stephen is coming from one direction and Saul of Tarsus is the other. And, and Stephen looks, he says, No, it can't be. Saul? You're here, Saul? Why, you nasty character. That's not, that's not what he's going to say. He's going to say, Saul, you were saved too. And Saul is going to say, it was your sermon. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Folks, let's not be afraid of speaking the truth in love. If we want people to be saved, you know, people say, don't offend people. You'll offend them right into hell. You will not offend them right into hell by not speaking up. God will save people by speaking the truth as it is in our Lord Jesus. Now, in our next session, we are going to finish this section about when the waters will flow again. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary-level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.